Uh, as Bob said, I'm Jim Garrett. I uh, really uh, enjoy the opportunity to be the Dean of the College of Engineering here at Carnegie Mellon uh, because of the kinds of interactions that Ellie talked about. And congratulations to you too, Ellie, on a wonderful event. I'd like to welcome everyone to this panel on smart home, smart car, smart city at the intersection of technology and business. Connectivity in 21st century cities will be made up of many different interacting systems, such as mobile and fixed connectivity, both above and below ground, and human to machine, machine to machine, and human to human. Above ground are the systems such as safety, fire, mass transit, bridges, buildings and homes, and someday soon, and in some cities uh, we're seeing it piloted, autonomous cars and trucks. Below ground are the systems such as water, sewerage, electrical power lines, which are invisible to residents until something surprisingly goes wrong. And many of you may have seen on last night's news uh, from North Boston where more than 40 homes are exploding or have exploded from gas leaks and they still don't know what's going on. These layers of machine-to-machine -machine interacting systems and network devices will be everywhere, and the data they generate will provide civic and business leaders the opportunity to much more proactively manage services and the costs like never before. But we, we must think creatively about the business models that, will, that we are going to have to adopt to be able to afford these kinds of systems and these kinds of approaches in the future. And also, we must never forget that cities are for people, and a smart city must seek to improve the quality of life of all of its citizens. Smart cities is an exciting topic because it requires many disciplines to work together, such as engineers and computer scientists who have been named many times today, but also behavioral economists, so, uh, ethicists, social scientists, architects, urban planners, and civic and business leaders. And of course, residents. And not just certain residents, all residents. Today's panel will address some of the important transformations that we can anticipate in the revolution of cities that is underway. I'd now like to introduce the moder moderator of this first panel, Raj Rajkumar. Raj is the George Westinghouse Professor in, our, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Raj is also the Director of Carnegie Mellon's Metro 21 Smart Cities Institute and the ideal person to lead an illuminating discussion on the future of cities. Raj? Welcome to all of you for uh, this, to this panel. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Garrett, uh, for your very kind introduction. There is a popular quip which claims that software is eating the world. Indeed, our individual and collective lifestyles seem to be increasingly paved with digital apps and services and digital bricks. Advances in computers, sensors, and actuators like motors are transforming not just the cyber world, but the physical world. With this rapid commoditization of uh, technological innovations, economies are being reshaped, entire industries are being disrupted, many jobs are lost to automation, even long-term brand name businesses are withering away and dying. Towns and neighborhoods, particularly in rural areas, are losing populations and standards of living. At the same time, opportunities for entrepreneurs abound. New markets open up. Technology companies constitute a growing and dominant share of the stock market capitalization. More jobs are being created. New businesses are born, and cities can become and are becoming smarter. What does all this digitization mean, digitization mean to each one of us as individuals, to society at large, 
to businesses small and large and to our infrastructure. We have here uh, assembled a distinguished panel to tell us what these changes mean and where we are headed. So let me introduce the panelists. Secretary Anthony Fox was the 17th US Transportation Secretary and is the founder and managing partner of Related Infrastructure. He became the 17th US Secretary of Transportation in 2013 and received an unprecedented 100 to 0 confirmation vote in the Senate. He developed the Obama administration's first surface transportation bill and the FAST Act passed. He pushed forward new rules governing the commercial use of drones, blueprinted a comprehensive national policy on autonomous vehicles, and launched the department's first and the administration's uh, smart city challenge, bringing more than 70 cities into the competition. He also placed nearly $30 billion in discretionary funds fund federal grants around the country. His new joint venture with the related companies, related infrastructure, is acquiring and investing in transportation-related service management and development businesses. He also advises Autotech Ventures LLC, a Silicon Valley venture capital firm, Hyperloop One that you may have heard of, and Tolco Investors, a family venture fund that focuses on artificial intelligence. Prior to joining the US DOT, he served as Charlotte's youngest, Charlotte, North Carolina, youngest mayor. Welcome, uh, Secretary Fox. <laughs> to my immediate left is uh, Brian Olsavsky. He is the senior vice president and uh, chief financial officer at Amazon.com since June 1st of 2015. He, uh, I guess, went up the ranks at Amazon fairly quickly, starting at very high levels. He used to be the president of finance for global consumer business, served as the chief financial officer of the worldwide consumer business group at Amazon, vice president of finance in the international and North American retail functions, as well as leading finance for Amazon's worldwide operations group. He also served as the vice president of finance for worldwide logistics for Thermo Fisher Scientific, was Vice President of Finance for the Fisher Chemicals business as well. He serves on Tepper's, uh, the Tepper School's uh, uh, Business Advisory Board. Uh, he received the Alumni Service Award from Carnegie Mellon for his accomplishments. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, Penn State University, was trained as a mechanical engineer, and he later uh, became an alumnus of uh, CMU, uh, completing his MBA in, in finance. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Uh, the third person on my left uh, to your, uh, is uh, Dr. Humaira Akbari, President and CEO of Acknowledged Partners LLC, a global strategy advisory firm providing services to leading private equity funds and large corporations in IoT, cybersecurity, big data and analytics, and supply chain visibility. She serves on the board of directors of several Fortune 500 companies, including Banco Santander, Landstar Systems, Jamalto, and Veolia. Uh, she held senior management roles in uh, Fortune 1000 companies, including Microsoft, Thales, and True Position. She has served as the president and CEO of Skybits Inc., uh, which was a leading provider of remote asset tracking and security solutions, and was finally sold to uh, Tellular Corporation. She holds a PhD with honors in particle physics from Tufts University and an MBA with distinction from CMU Stepper. Welcome, Amira. <laughs> uh, all the way to my left, uh, Dr. J. App is a professor here at uh, CMU at the Tepper School of Business and the CMU Department of Engineering and Public Policy, which is in the College of Engineering. He is the co-director of the Carnegie Mellon Electricit Electricity Industry Center and the director of the Renewables Project, Renew Elec Project. Uh, he has authored more than 100 papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals, as well as two books and several book chapters. He has published opinion per pieces in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. Uh, he received an AB in uh, physics from the Harvard College in 1971, a PhD in physics from MIT in 1976. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. 
He received the NASA Distinguished Service Medal in 1997 and the Metcalf Lifetime Achievement Award for significant contributions to engineering in 2002. So welcome, Jay. So as you can see, we have a very <laughs> distinguished panel. Um, so, I, so we'll do the following. I'll uh, target specific <coughs> questions to uh, individual panelists first to cover their areas of expertise, and then I'll ask them a bunch of broad questions that any of the panelists can actually can take. And then hopefully, we'll have some time left for basically taking questions from the audience. Uh, uh, questions are coming out on the web as well. They will get curated, and hopefully we'll have time to address that. Uh, so the first question will uh, be addressed to uh, Brian, uh, Chief Financial Officer at Amazon. So Brian, given the rapid development of digital and intelligent assistance, I guess I'm thinking Alexa, mm -hmm. what is your vision for the future? Well, I would start by saying, um, we're asking the question, how many of you have digital uh, devices in your homes? Okay, and how many of you use them daily? <laughs> okay, so statistics would say that about a third of the uh, population right now has digital assistance. That number should be uh, above 50% next year. Um, about 70% say they, of those uh, thir one third say they use them daily. So it's getting good adoption. Um, and that's what's key here is it has to be uh, enticing and useful con for consumers or it will be considered a toy. Um, I remember distinctly huddling my family around the uh, demo Alexa uh, version that I had three years ago and said, come here, listen to this. And I said, um, Alexa, who's the CFO of Amazon.com? <laughs> and the, uh, and uh, Alexa answered quickly and said, the CFO of Amazon.com is Jeff Bezos. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so we put it in the closet and said, we're not using that again. No, so that's actually a true story. Um, but what we, uh, you know, what we see is that uh, we are seeing you know, great adoption. We're sell selling tens of millions of these devices, as is Google. Um, we know that uh, you'll use it for music. Uh, music. Music subscription services are booming. Ours has doubled in the last uh, year, at least doubled. Um, we know you use it for games. We, you ask uh, the weather, you ask questions. Uh, Jeopardy is a very big, um, use, uh, people like to, to play Jeopardy on it. Um, then you'll connect your home, you'll, you'll connect your coffee maker, you'll connect uh, light bulb switches, you'll connect um, uh, eventually your heat and your security systems. It's starting to make its way into the, the home theaters. Uh, any of you who have used the um, remote to try and look up a, a, you know, type with a remote, try that. Uh, you'll, now, you'll now appreciate the fact that you can say, Alexa, uh, play Mission Impossible, and you'll say, Alexa, back up three minutes. Uh, Alexa, fast forward three minutes. So all really useful things, but you know, that will not quite be enough uh, to get the 100%. That's, that's not the full vision. As we say, it's still day one in, in this technology. So what we do at Amazon is we try and um, you know, do our part. We're making devices that are uh, better and better all the time. Not only do they have great speakers, but they have the far field capability to pull your voice in so you're not asking questions on a repeated basis. We put a lot of money into natural uh, language understanding. So again, uh, Alexa knows what you want. We put, we put uh, money into machine learning and um, artificial intelligence so that when you go to say, I'd like to order a D cell battery, it orders you a D cell battery, not a diesel fuel battery, <laughs> which is, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a real use case. So, I would say uh, you know, it's incumbent on us, the, the uh, people who are developing products for the market, to make them as useful as possible, and that'll drive adoption. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, so will our lives be managed by robotic butlers? Will we have a digital assistant at all times at work and at home? Well, you know, I think the, uh, there will be you know, many use cases. There will be many voice services. And I doubt that you'll see one specific butler or one ring to rule them all, right? So it's what, what we, uh, we know that as a consumer, you're probably not going to want to have too many, but you may have them for different use cases. We, uh, our Alexa service uh, is compatible with Microsoft's Cortana, 
so that you can use uh, Alexa on a computer on a, a, a Surface tablet, and you can also use Cortana on an Echo device. So we think there'll be uh, you know, different use cases where there'll be uh, different voice services. We'll see what develops in the car. Um, uh, and again, I think you know, it's incumbent on us to make these products as useful as possible for you. So with all this virtual intelligence sitting in the cloud, what does that eventually mean to things like human thought, human contact, or even human autonomy? The philosophical question, I guess. Yes. I was an engineering undergrad, so not a, <laughs> I didn't wander over to the philosophy school, but I will take a stab at that. Um, you know, if you think about it, the digital assistants are breaking your relationship with keyboards and computers and TV remote controls. And in our, in our uh, Amazon Go stores in the uh, Seattle area, you'll see them eventually with checkout lines and checkout. You know. So I think that um, you know, it will increase the productivity of mankind. Uh, I think technology always has. Um, there will be th uh, things that we'll have to watch on use cases. But generally, um, you know, technology has been a driver of productivity. And we see these devices as well. The other thing I'll point out is that um, especially the voice devices are giving great access to people with disabilities, uh, people who are blind, elderly people, um, people who can't see well. They uh, get great utility out of being able to control a computer with their voice. We hear from grandparents that they're, seeing their, they're getting to see their grandchildren on the Echo Show devices and they can drop in. And yes, they can do it on their phone with FaceTime, but it's just, a, it's just another richer experience. So it's really, uh, really seen as being useful for, for people who, are, uh, who have certain disabilities as well. Uh, thank you, Brian. Okay. Uh, Secretary Fox, uh, there seem to be three major trends in the transportation space, electrification, automation, and connectivity. Uh, so given these trends, what is the future of passenger and freight transportation for automobiles, commercial aircraft, shipping, hyperloop, uh, interstellar travel, drones? <laughs> <laughs> and you have, you have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> he works at Amazon. He figures this out. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> let's start with, with sort of a status check on where we are with um, both personal and freight mobility. And I'll use some anecdotes. Um, uh, Good comes into the Port of Los Angeles and it's on its way to the East Coast. It takes two days to get from Los Angeles to Chicago, let's say. But because of congestion and um, overlapping rails and all kinds of problems, it takes those same goods two days to get through Chicago. And that's emblematic of what's happening with a lot of our uh, freight networks is that there are very clear, distinct bottlenecks around the country that we can see. And sometimes it's a, it's a roadway, sometimes it's a rail situation. We actually have places around the country that have congested airspace, um, which you probably have noticed if you go to fly out of places uh, like uh, LaGuardia and you're sitting on the tarmac for several minutes, part of that is because there's both ground and air congestion. So we're a congested society. And as has been pointed out, as population gravitates more and more to our urban regions, that congestion is only going to get worse if left to its own devices. Personal mobility is also changing. Um, uh, I was driving last week in my hometown of Charlotte, and by the way, uh, uh, I have to also acknowledge uh, David Tepper, not only for his incredible role here at Carnegie Mellon, but his incredible role at taking my Carolina Panthers to the Super Bowl. Uh, uh, <laughs> but um, at any rate, um, personal mobility is changing. So. Uh, we obviously have the entrant of the, of the TNCs and uh, people making more and more choices to buy the trip as opposed to buy a vehicle. Um, but now you're starting to see even shorter trips being taken up by bikes and scooters and other things inside of cities, which is creating all kinds of, uh, uh, all kinds of challenges. So the upshot is, is I think for most of us in this country, 
um, cities are going to be the place where a lot of this stuff gets litigated out. Um, hopefully not, not, uh, uh, not actually litigated, but hopefully by virtue of good decision making. And I would just say there, there are sort of three things that I would be on the lookout for here. Um, the first is, where does the control sit to make decisions? Um, sometimes, even though the congestion and all these things sort of converge in our urban areas, sometimes the decision making to solve for that is at the state level and at the federal level. And there's, there's got to be good coordination among all three to actually incorporate technology. Uh, third, uh, second, you're going to need to have a reason for um, these engineers who deploy a lot of our transportation solutions to try something different. And one of the ways we tried to do that at the federal government was through our Smart City Challenge. Um, we actually put, uh, you know, it was a modest amount of, of federal money, uh, $40 million up uh, for a medium-sized city to actually experiment with new technologies that could improve congestion, reduce climate change, solve for a number of, uh, of, of issues. And we're going to need government at every level to encourage innovation on some level. Now that comes at risk, and governments aren't good at risk because if something fails, they're going to get blamed for it. Um, but we saw great examples, and I hope I can talk about that more later. And the third piece is that um, uh, when I'd go to mayor's conferences when I was a mayor, uh, I'd have people coming up to me trying to sell me parking meters. Um, and um, there's going to, they had cool parking meters, parking meters that used solar, parking meters that were digitized, payment systems, and all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it's not the tactical pieces of technology that are going to matter. It's going to be the overall improvement in the quality of life for citizens. And I think what we understate today is the fact that I think cities will be um, market shapers of the technologies that actually get deployed. And so you need to have enlightened leadership at the city level, both elected as well as, uh, as, well as the staff level. Uh, Secretary Fox, do you foresee a future in which no one knows how to drive a car or fly a plane? Um, I think in some cases we're already there with planes. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to so many people who are like, I don't want to get into an autonomous car, I'm scared. And uh, they just flew from here to Beijing or someplace and, you know, you were actually in a driverless plane because uh, a lot of that technology is moving the plane on autopilot. Um, but we do have a challenge with, with this question. I, I think that my kids, there's a reasonable chance that my kids um, will, will not own a car. There's a reasonable chance that my kids, while they probably will take driver's ed, there's a reasonable chance that they will spend less, much, much less of their time driving than, than I ever did. Um, and I hope that's true for my daughter, who's 14. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there is a challenge, which we'll talk about, I hope, later, which is that um, with that, we worried at USDOT about the problem of re-engagement. So if you, if, you, if you create these systems that, that encourage less engagement by the human operator, let's say, uh, under what circumstances do you re-engage that human being and what kind of training is necessary from a human behavioral standpoint to enable that engagement to occur? Um, and that's going to be the next problem we have with some of this technology. Uh, thank you, Secretary mm -hmm. Fox. Uh, Dr. Akbari, uh, Mera, what does it mean exactly to have a city be smart? Uh, what are the benefits? What are the uh, impacts, conveniences? Yeah, before I answer that question, I just wanted to tell Secretary Fox that I do not have a car, and I live in New York City and Dallas, and people in Dallas are like, you don't have a car? Yeah. And they say, I don't. So I think that um, I'm trying to act like I'm 14 years old. <laughs> but but I, I do think this is going to happen. And I'm in a bunch of boards where we're discussing this in, to death. And, and everybody says, no, no, you're, you're an uh, anomaly. I say, that's not true. When in late 90s, we, I was a consultant. We did a study at, at, just outside of Carnegie Mellon. I went to management consulting. And we were doing a study for Verizon. 
and told them that by uh, you know mid 2000 there will be like 35 percent of Americans would not have mobile would not have fixed phone we only would rely on their mobile phones and they're like you're crazy <laughs> and it happened so point is I, I do I am strong believer despite some of my boards and some of the companies we advise do not like to hear that but back to smart city I think that you know obviously with some of the things that uh, secretary Fox said that it's very related but what is the definition of a smart city it's really urban communities which which leverage technology and drive ser services and solutions from them to, on one hand, provide a level of uh, um, livability, affordability, experience, and engagement to their citizens, and the other hand, to provide basically transparency, efficiency, low cost to their in infrastructure and reliability, not to mention. Smart city certainly is not like building and um, an infrastructure, but it is about optimizing the infrastructure. So the drivers for smart cities today is first and foremost, what was already mentioned, is the demographic pressures. Our population by 2050 will go to almost 10 billion. And guess what? Six, two thirds of that population will live in the cities. Today that number is 55 and we're a much smaller number of population. So we are seeing the emergence of what's called mega cities. 2010, we had only 30 mega cities in the US, I mean worldwide, sorry. And today we have 47, of which many of them are in China. But nevertheless, the mega city trend is moving, and mega city is a city which has at least 10 million population. And so with all of that pressure, you have this demographic pressure where what is, it results in congestion which is traffic congestion, water usage, energy, pollution, security and safety conditions on one hand. On the other hand, unfortunately, we have very aging infrastructure and we see it every day, bridges falling in. This morning I was listening you know, to in Genova in, in um, Italy, a bridge fell and killed so many people. And, but that, that's happening all the time. So we have that, and then we have economic pressures, in a sense that cities are out of money. I mean, you know that better than I. Cities are out of money, and they have to compete with other cities to get like Amazon's second headquarter, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so what happens is these cities are like, how do, I, how do I manage that? So many of them are actually going to smart because it saves them costs, it brings them a lot of you know, benefits and impacts, as you mentioned, but it also allows like Amazons and other really that private and public uh, um, partnership to take place and therefore the, the economic impact is quite interesting. Uh, so we have all these technologies and different kinds of sensors and actuation for uh, lights and, and such. How are all these things going to be interconnected? Well, so that's the that's difficulty. <laughs> so cities, the smart cities is just like um, autonomous vehicle where there's five levels and you know, we're going to make progress along the, the, the levels. Um, there are several, what I call there are three stages and I made it up, so it's, I didn't really, there's three stages to a smart city. For, well, maybe four stages, but the three stages for at least what I call existing cities or legacy cities. First is where they, you know, cities that are testing and um, really trialing with the specific applications. One of them being you know, very famous is smart parking, for example. But there are you know, the bike riding. In fact, France just this morning announced that they're going to spend $350 million to, to triple the number of bikes used. But the $350 million is not just buying new bikes, but actually building the infrastructure so people are enticed to use the bikes. So I am seeing in, in um, Dallas more usage of a scooter than bikes because I think people in Dallas don't want to walk or, or do any, <laughs> expense any energy. But, um, <laughs> so, um, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the, anyways, uh, um, I, I do think the stage two is when smart cities will take these different dispersed, if you like, applications and try to put them in a platform. 
And then stage three is where they really first, you know, think about how do I build the platform first and then bring the, you know, sort of the applications on it, which is very, very tricky. Or going from a stage two to three is very tricky. Why? Because we have these infrastructures that exist. So I'm on board of a comp French company called Veolia. And we think about this all the time. How do we make all of our, you know, we feed one billion population with drinking water and we do a lot of wastewater management and whatnot. So very big operation, $28 billion. But how do we expand, you know, all of the sensors? We have about 3 million sensors now in water management for our water in, in France. And we do, we do really give very nice experience to our, um, our users, but it's, you know, nothing. You need really 200 million or 300 million sensors around the world. That, uh, thank you, Hamira. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Jay Abt, uh, so Jay is an expert on electricity. Um, how will our electric grid support and enable these transformational digital innovations? Uh, can the grid handle the load? Will it be secure? Uh, so I guess clearly we need to have a smart grid. What, the, what does it mean? Uh, what are the benefits and are, are we getting there? Well, Raj, to uh, paraphrase what one of our senior associate deans here at Tepper said, you can't have smart anything without electricity, right? <laughs> and that's, so that's why we have a center here with folks from six different departments. Um, it is really the intersection studying the electric power industry here, and it's why uh, some nutty physicist like me gets tenure in a business school, so that we can uh, study those. The quick answer to your question is very much like what Secretary Fox has observed, which is many of the benefits aren't the uh, popular mechanics, science fiction -y stuff. They are really interesting, prosaic benefits that emerge from how you set up the technology. Right, so we first got automated meters that meant that the poor folks who had to go around slogging through the snow, uh, getting chased by barking dogs, don't have to do that anymore. They're all remotely red. They thought that was pretty smart. They liked that smart grid. And now they've evolved into meters that measure your electric use every 15 minutes. That means that the kind of congestion on the grid that Secretary Fox was talking about can be monetized. I can get paid to relieve congestion on the grid right where my house is. That's the dream, and we're starting to do that in some places. There are some demonstrations. Um, this is your level one. Cities like Malmo and Sweden have some demonstrations there. But what we're really seeing as a huge benefit is that because these meters send out a heartbeat signal to the electric company that says, I'm here, or I don't hear you, maybe you're not here, the electric companies can map outages. You don't have to call on the phone anymore to say my electric power is out. And they can figure out exactly which parts of the grid are out, and they can roll the truck right there. The other kinds of automation that are happening on the grid are the systems that tell them where exactly on the power line the faults are. Some of those faults can now be cured automatically. If a tree brushes a power line and shorts to ground, it used to be that you had to roll a truck with two folks in there and figure it out. Now there's an automatic recloser that tries every few seconds, and if the tree limb's no longer shorting the wire, you get power back right away. That's a big benefit. And so we call it, instead of smart grid, we call it grid modernization. We see those kind of things all the way up to the transmission system where we're seeing sensors uh, all through the system. To answer your question about whether it can support uh, the kind of information infrastructure that we're seeing, the answer is a qualified yes. We have power outages in this country that are not the envy of the world. We haven't spent as much on reliability in the US as they have uh, in France, for example. And so we have outages. Each of you as a customer can expect one or two outages a year for an hour or two, and some of them are longer. Well, when it's not just your VCR, you've seen those in a museum, flashing uh, a uh, red midnight, but rather it's your um, SpaceX or Tesla plant that goes down, that's a problem. 
And so now what we're doing is we're incentivizing distributed energy resources that can keep the grid up, batteries. Uh, we have uh, companies like AutoGrid that just raised this week a $34 million Series D financing that help flexible resources keep the grid up. That also helps to integrate distributed energy resources, PV on your house, uh, wind, other renewables on the grid, and all that's very helpful. Thank you. I, I guess, uh, as you pointed out, uh, electricity is needed by all these smart devices, yeah. going to be all across. Uh, will the future grid be able to uh, cope with these ever-increasing demands? At the At same time, being smart, will the blackouts and brownouts disappear? Blackouts and brownouts will never disappear, right? It, you have, again, anything else in economics, you've got a point where the marginal cost and the marginal benefit are equal, and the knee of that curve is probably a few outages from time to time, but not the level that we have now. It's impossible to say that the grid will become invulnerable, and it'd be very expensive if you could. So what you want to do is make sure that the essential services, traffic lights leading to the hospitals, the kinds of sensors that are necessary for smart transportation, other things that they have power. And you can do that in lots of ways. I can put uh, solar panels and batteries on the essential traffic lights on Fifth and Forbes leading to the hospitals here and do that much cheaper than the grid. So we are here at CMU, we're thinking broadly about how you keep those essential services running rather than the, the narrow question of can you keep the grid invulnerable. Look at the folks in the Carolinas today. The grid's not invulnerable, but with things like microgrids, uh, distributed generation, they'll be able to get those essential services back up faster than they would have 10 years ago. Yep. Uh, thank you, Jay. So let me pose uh, a couple of very broad questions mm -hmm. to the panel, and any panelist can uh, volunteer to answer the question. Mm -hmm. um, what are the primary drivers out there to accelerate the adoption of uh, technologies for the smart home, smart car and smart city. And then, if you, uh, if you, if you will, uh, could you address the question of the dynamics among those ecosystem players? For example, is there a role for public-private partnership? Mm -hmm. okay. So what are the primary drivers for these technologies? Who wants to take this? Don't all speak at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, no mentioned, I mentioned that, um, you know, as as a key player in uh, the digital assistant and the voice assistant, um, our goals are to make them better, make them more available, make them cheaper, make the products uh, each generation better, uh, uh, and actually bring down that the cost so it's affordable for you know, and, and not only for individuals but also so you can have many of them throughout your home. Uh, you'll eventually have them in your car, um, so you can have it with you at all times. Thank you. I, Mary, you want to well, I, um, yeah, I, I wanted to say, depending on different pieces that you take, for example, autonomous vehicle, the driver really is Tesla and startups and big tech, because otherwise OEMs have been thinking about this forever, but they have been just sitting on their back and, you know, talk, 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 <laughs> till eventually, for example, for electric vehicle, it was all Tesla. Now everyone is building an electric vehicle, and autonomous is the same. So it's between really... Um, big tech plays a huge role. It's no longer just a startup, so, and, and that includes Amazon, and, um, but also Google and Facebook and whatnot, uh, um, Apple. And, and I think that's one of the big drivers uh, that really pushes, uh, pushes it. Uh, now, for something like smart city, it's a little different. Um, you have, it's very complex, a smart city, and there are many, many aspects to it. It's really the definition is like IoT, anything and everything is IoT, anything, everything is a smart city. There I do think that um, outside of, you know, obviously government is very, very important, uh, but I do think it's just like a smart home where we had a lot of different startups, we're doing a lot of things, and then we are now converging into one company, sort of. <laughs> I won't mention which one, but <laughs> but um, but I think that there you do need a big player to come in in the smart cities or several big players and really try to converge things because otherwise I think it'd be very hard to go for for example from level two to level three. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, I, and I don't know what you. Th yeah, um, I'm happy to to jump in on both the car and the city. Um, 
When I was going through my confirmation process in 2013, there was not a word said about autonomous vehicles. <laughs> um, and when I started doing a little road show after getting into the seat, um, I realized that we were making some mistakes in terms of preference at the federal level. And here's what I mean. Um, we had started a process of d adopting a connected car rule, um, essentially using DSRC technology to have cars communicating with each other as our pathway to automation. And I met with some, uh, some technologists who felt that that was an interim step that wasn't necessary. And so what we did was we developed um, an autonomous vehicle paper or guidance, basically, that gave people who were building autonomous fleets an idea of how the regulatory environment should, should progress and gave them clues as to what we would be looking at on issues around safety and deployment. And that really, I think, gave the autonomous vehicle industry kind of a lifeline to actually come into existence because there was more clarity about how the federal government would, would engage. And just one quick example, today, when you go get your driver's license from your state, the state is basically saying, okay, you're, you're, you're certified to operate a vehicle. You've, you know how to make the left turn, the right turn, et cetera. Well, how do you do that for an autonomous car? And whose responsibility is it? Because today, the federal government's responsibility is to make sure that the physical integrity of the car is, is, is good. But the states have basically been conferred with the operating responsibilities by certifying. So we decided as part of our guidance that that, that should be part of the federal motor vehicle safety standards. And you shouldn't have 50 different tests out there for these vehicles. So anyway, those were kinds of clarifying things that I think are critical for the autonomous vehicle to actually come into existence. With cities, I think, I think there's not going to be one model for a smart city. I think the smartest cities are going to be cities that understand their own dynamics, their own economies, their own challenges, and they build technology solutions around those. And I'll use Columbus, uh, Ohio as an example. Columbus had fourth highest infant mor four times the infant mortality rate of any country in uh, mm -hmm. any city in the country. They're very conscious of this. And on the surface, it has nothing to do with transportation or smart cities. But as part of their smart city package, what they did was they said, we're going to create an app. And mom's going to be able to set up her doctor's appointment using the app. If she doesn't have a bank account, she's going to be able to use cash. If she doesn't have a phone, we're going to have kiosks in neighborhoods that have a high propensity towards this. And we're going to be able to set up a transit trip for her to get to and from the doctor. And if, if the bus is late or something, we'll get the, the, the appointment rescheduled. These are things that mayors are having to think about. It's not just is the technology available, but is it available to the entire group of people that you have to represent? And that's why I think cities as drivers of smart city technology are going to be so innovative. I mean, just uh, because I teach in a business school, put in a word for um, non-government, private enterprise. And I'll show you what I mean. Some of the work that we've done here at Carnegie Mellon uh, looks at whether you can use vehicles, cars like my Chevy Volt, uh, as virtual storage batteries. And just this week, a company called eMotor Works, who makes the charger that I use for my Chevy Volt, uh, has signed a deal with the state of California where they have modulated the charging going in out of the battery. I can't use the battery in my car as a grid resource because it voids the warranty. But what I can do is I can modify the charge going into it to charge only when the grid is really ready to do that <coughs> and stop the charging when the grid needs some help. And they have a 70 megawatt battery now that is bidding into the system that has been set up in the market in California uh, to um, uh, act as what we call ancillary services for that. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing mo work from universities like Carnegie Mellon that said this was possible get picked up by private enterprise. And uh, I'm seeing that all throughout the smart revolution. And I think that's really great. It's wonderful to have top-down stuff. But we're also seeing 
when the right environment is created by smart mm -hmm. mayors, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that we can get this stuff popping out of the ground in um, lots of ways, some of which will be uh, companies that are spun out of CMU. Uh, uh, thank you, Jay. So uh, we've been talking about the <coughs> promise of these uh, technologies, but is there a flip side? Someone could hack into our smart infrastructure, shut everything down, uh, a disaster like the hurricane that we are facing, or electromagnetic disturbance from the sun could leave us cold in the winter, hot in the summers, and then completely in the dark perhaps for uh, days at a time. So with our whole life digitized and interconnected, how do we handle threats uh, to the safety of the infrastructure? Anybody? Well, I can talk about the sun stuff. We're, we're just doing some work now on uh, solar flares. There was a big one in 1859 um, that, if it was replicated today, would have some amusement, shall we say, with the grid. And so the kinds of things that we're doing is looking into the history and seeing what that would do to the grid today and saying, okay, there are a few pretty simple things that we can do to mitigate uh, that kind of a flare causing problems now. And so we're getting uh, transformers that aren't susceptible to the kind of melding of their core that would have happened with that flare and it happened with a couple of smaller flares 10 years ago. Those are the kind of things that uh, we're doing for the grid. Now, with the cybersecurity, I'll let more experts talk. I will observe only the old saying that the S in IOT stands for security. <laughs> so that leads us to uh, Brian. So Brian, uh, can, uh, uh, can Alexa be taken over and then control my house? I don't think that's a big risk. Um, you know, not today's technology. So I, but I, I will also bring up another example of you know, protective technologies. I mean, by having cloud backup and, you know, your term papers and your, you know, your research papers in the cloud, uh, it protects you from any, you know, issue that may happen locally to you, your computer, your office, whatever. So I think they're, you know, technology giveth and technology taketh away, and I think that's one where it, um, it really helps us. Well, I mean, being on board of an infrastructure company, water management, waste management, and work a lot with cybersecurity companies. I don't want to scare you, but I can tell you we're not protected. Period. We really are not. You and just I scared me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I really am scared, and uh, it is just by luck <laughs> that we continue, because if somebody wanted to be malicious today, if a group decided they want to be malicious, they'll get it. They'll get not just US, but everywhere in the world, and it's even worse. So, so um, good news is cybersecurity and the, that how it is being treated has gone up dramatically in the levels of um, sort of the boards and companies. So lots of money obviously is going to it, lots of you know, spending. But the reality with cybersecurity, whether we like it or not, and you know, including Amazon, who is very good, highly secured, using one of my other companies, Gemalto <laughs> and Talos. But, but they, um, it, it is that we will never be fully, fully, fully protected. So, you know, somebody said, if you want to be fully protected, just take your Disconnect. computer off <laughs> the net and, and, and electricity. But um, so what we have to do is definitely build the defense. And um, you know, I think the good news is we are moving in that direction. Bad news is it's very slow and we're very unprotected to start with. Okay. I don't really have an answer though. The, the, the automobile is an interesting case um, because I think there's a lot of effort going on within each auto manufacturer to fortify their systems against cyber attacks. But as you think about automation in an autonomous vehicle, um, I think it's going to be critical that the industry find a way to share best practices. Um, because mm -hmm. a threat to one is really a threat to the entire category. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that recognition is as, is, is serious today as it probably should be. Uh, thank you. Uh, so overall, what excites you most 
about our digital future and what most concerns you? Well, let me just start by saying uh, something, again, prosaic, because I think the, the kinds of things that we do at CMU is very practical stuff. One of the things that really excites me is the prospect of making the decisions in the electric power industry that cut the biggest threat right now. It's not cybersecurity. It's not resiliency of the grid. It's the fact that we're killing 10,000 people a year from pollution in the electric power industry. Mm -hmm. One of our experts is sitting right there, uh, Professor Nick Muller. And due to the work that people like Nick have done, we're able to take the cyber infrastructure in the grid now and the market infrastructure and bid for lowest pollution. And that really excites me. If we can extend those 10,000 people's lives, with the kind of markets and automation that we're getting now, that's a big win. And so that really excites me. Anything concerns you? Sorry? Anything concerns you? Oh, lots of things concern me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that there are things that when they rise up to the level of consciousness, people deal with. Uh, there'll be a later session on blockchain. And what we're seeing now is that to do a single transaction uh, with the technology in Bitcoin it takes 900 kilowatt hours. That's about what it takes to run an average house for a month. One of their competitors, Ethereum, takes about 100 kilowatt hours, one ninth of that. And that's a technology uh, called proof of work. There's another technology that has about 30% market share uh, called proof of stake that uses considerably less energy. And so I think that when things rise to the level where people do get concerned, we often are able to develop solutions uh, that come out of technology. Um, and I like that. That excites me, too. So what concerns me is twofold. One is privacy. I think there won't be privacy. And you know, so we have to think about that. And secondly, while tech, every time we had a revolution in technology, we've somehow been able to increase the labor force and more jobs for people. I'm not certain this time around it would be the case. So I do think that the, the sort of digital divide between people who have and people don't have, because the people who don't have are the ones who just, you know, they're not software developer, they, and then they just, they just get left behind, and there won't be actually jobs for them. So I think that that's, those are the two things that concerns me most. What excites you? Um, I'm technologist but in heart, so I'm just very excited when I see technology revolutionizes and reinvents day in, day out, things we do. Um, on a personal basis, I love not seeing a lot of cars around me. I, I walk, I'm a walker, I walk 10 miles a day, so that excites me. <laughs> okay. I'm excited by the prospect that Technology may make it possible for humankind to not replicate problems. But I'm also terrified that technology will replicate problems. <laughs> um, and I'll use you know, inequality as, as one example. Um, we, we have tools that are being developed today that can, that can flatten the curve in terms of opportunity for people. Um, but the deployment answers sometimes embed kind of a, an economic um, block to those solutions. And so, you know, I'm hopeful that, um, that we'll find a way because um, it's one of those things where no matter where you go, there you are. You know, the technology can change, but, um, you know, whether it's um, class issues or race or gender or any number of things that we still, uh, particularly in this country, struggle with, um, I think we're going to have to have some out of the box thinking. And you know, I hope that as technologies developed, the kind of instant interdisciplinary approach that Carnegie Mellon is fostering here becomes the standard. Because you don't need engineers just building stuff. You need someone sitting back and saying, OK, now what? And, and this is going to work because, and what is the end game for a lot of, a lot of these solutions? Yes. Brian, do you want to add something? Yeah, what, what I'm excited about is um, 
I think technology is a great uh, force for democracy. I think it um, gives people access to information without having to, um, for instance, come to a place like Carnegie Mellon. They don't have to necessarily come here uh, and be one of the selected students who have, happens to get in here. You can uh, go to other schools. You can take online learning. It can expand, expands the reach um, and expands access. Um, you know, one comment on, on the jobs issue, I think that if we were sitting here in the 1800s, we wouldn't be sitting here in the 1800s. We'd be on farms. We'd all be out farming. Like over 80% of the population was involved in agriculture. It's less than 2%, I believe, today. Mm -hmm. So there's been constant, uh, technology's been a constant force of uh, innovation. And while I agree that skill sets need to adapt, I do think the, the uh, saving of uh, mundane tasks and effort will free us up to do other things. I, I look at Amazon and we had, uh, we acquired a, a robotics company a number of years ago and everyone thought, well, they're just going to eliminate all their jobs in the factory or in the warehouses. And it's been just the opposite. It's what it's allowed us to do is to build bigger, denser warehouses, get more product close to a city like Pittsburgh or a city like Seattle. So therefore you, you cut down on you know, split shipments, transportation costs, the jobs become much better. Uh, people used to walk through a warehouse and they would walk, uh, some of those jobs, you'd walk 10 miles a day picking things. Now the whole technology brings the product to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, you create a whole new set of jobs for people who are in charge of the automation and the uh, equipment in a, in a fulfillment center, as we call them. So you know, we have to morph and we have to adapt, but I'm not as um, uh, uh, concerned about the job losses. I think we just, we, we redirect and find new things to do. Anything that concerns you about the future? Um, I don't quite understand. I say there's a, a personal citizen, not a uh, representative of Amazon, but I, I don't know the implications for military and war with when you take um, the, you know, the bloodshed out of it, and or at least on our side, you know, whoever side who has controls. If you're fighting with robots, if you're fighting with drones, if you're fighting with, uh, I, th I think it, uh, can minimize um, the cost of war, at least for the people who maybe have the technology. And I think that would be probably more to uh, the last comment that would be uh, you know, making mankind worse. Uh, thanks, Brian. We have a couple of questions for online. You can actually submit questions online. We have uh, Trey Thompson asking the following question. How do we prevent the benefits of smart cities from concentrating in the regions, towns, and neighborhoods that already control the most resources and influence? I guess it's more the equalization question, if you will. Yeah, it's, it's, it, that's where it takes political leadership because a lot of this, some of this stuff will get deployed just because it's more private market stuff. But a fair amount of it will have to come in through some regulatory process, and that's where it <coughs> comes up to the public officials to kind of demand a flattening of that of that of that curve, um, and that's one of the things that worries me is that um, there's such a competition to be first among cities that um, sometimes I think they can risk jeopardizing a little bit of their leverage to get this stuff like deployed everywhere. Um, there are. There was a race for a while to get fiber optic laid in cities. Um, and uh, not all cities got that fiber optic, uh, optic stuff laid in places that were underserved. Um, and that'll continue to be a problem until they do. So it's a, it's a vigilance issue for political leadership. And, and actually, voters and citizens should be demanding that, that folks pay attention to these things. Anybody else wants to add to that? Um, yeah, Perfect. Uh, so uh, the next question, how do you see policies supporting the advancement and implementation of technology to build smart cities? And what are the top three challenges? What are the policy challenges? <laughs> He's better to <laughs> <that. laughs> Well, I, I mean, again, I think coordination, federal, state, and local coordination, critical. Um, we are more complicated in this country in transportation, for example than most countries around the world because we have this sort of spaghetti bowl of governance. Um, secondly, um, educating the 
the deployers, the people who actually own mm -hmm. the front lines, who've been, you know, laying cable for the last 30 years, you know, teaching them, teaching them new ways to do things is going to be a challenge. And I would say the last one is interoperability. Um, you know, if I mm -hmm. put a solution into Pittsburgh, um, but it doesn't, uh, it's a different technology than Harrisburg or Philadelphia, you know, at some point we are all the same user. And so like finding that interoperability is gonna be critical. I'll give you another example. Um, high speed rail, uh, there's a system that's going into the east coast of Florida. Um, and uh, Dallas and Houston are looking at doing a system and they're using different technology and California's looking at a system that's probably using different technology. And at some point you hope these things all link up, but when they do, is the train set that started in one place gonna be able to, to end the trip going cross country? And, and you know, I think we have those challenges all over the place. Hey, Raj, I, let, me, let me add sorry. to that uh, one thing, which is that open standards for things in my area of electric power are really critical. Mm -hmm. And if I have a, um, a home meter that only ITRON or someone else uh, can read, that's not going to be future-proof and it's not going to encourage innovation. And so one of the critical things, I think, as we do roll these things out, is to encourage, at all levels, open standards. Yeah, and the other thing I wanted to say is don't forget the user experience. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that uh, sometimes is just ignored and, and therefore, oh, we roll out these things but nobody uses them because, well, it's horrible user experience, actually. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions from the live audience here? This yes. One. Secretary Fox is the expert on the topic. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, autonomous trucks will uh, put hundreds of thousands of uh, truck drivers and operators out of work. Right? Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it is a real issue. And uh, I don't think anyone has a clear answer to, to, to what takes up that, that part of the labor force as we go forward. I think there are obviously on a bigger picture scale, retraining, repositioning of people so they have a, a wider palette of experience to draw on for work. Um, but what I, what I will say to you is that um, when I left the administration, um, when I left the government, one of the things we left was a panel. Uh, we had 25 people, uh, experts on automation, and a big part of what this group was tasked with was looking at that very question, the future of work and labor market disruption and sort of what government's response should be. And um, it was subsequently disbanded, um, but I think that is, a, that is something that we need to, to have our eyes mm -hmm. on because I don't think there is a clear answer. I, I do believe, I think as has been said, that, that human beings will find ways to put their effort towards something that will generate work, but, um, but it, it, it's gonna take conscious thought on our part as, as uh, public sector actors. Let me just say something about that particular issue. What we're seeing is, at the moment, a shortage of long haul truckers, not for the city truckers. Drivers, yeah. Drivers, I mean, mm -hmm. truckers, yeah. Yes. And what would be a good melding of uh, autonomy with people would be ones where the easier technology problem, the long haul problem on the highways, 
uh, is automated or at least partially automated. And then the tougher problem, driving around cities, goes to folks in cities and we don't have a shortage of drivers in the cities. Mm -hmm. And so that's an appropriate use of technology. Yep, I mean, I would, exactly, because I'm also in <laughs> trucking. And, and, and uh, what it is is, it, this shortage has been around, but it is only going to get worse. So partly the whole autonomous thing is actually for the industry is trying to think, how would I deal with this shortage? So it's like a two-way problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and by the way, majority, the average age of these truckers is very high. It's like about 50, these drivers is about 50 years old. So young people are not even. So in some ways, you know, technology uh, sort of leads the way of the people choosing what the skill sets they want. And, and over time, I think some of that will happen naturally. Having said that, I mean, we're decades away. I'm, I believe, before we don't need anybody in the truck. <laughs> I mean, we definitely need one or two people in the truck as a safety driver at the minimum. Any other questions from the live audience? Ask a question here. Go ahead. Can you stand up, please? Yeah. Um, uh, how do we flatten the uh, uh, opportunity curve? What is being done? Yeah. So a lot of transportation technology is now being thought about running through your mobile device, right? Um, even like it won't be too far into the future before you actually you don't have a physical key to your car. This thing like turns your car off, like literally. Some, some cars already have it. Um, but the penetration rate of mobile phones is not 100%, right? And so um, with the Smart City Challenge, we found cities found a way to work with companies to put kiosks in neighborhoods so that folks had the functional equivalent of the same um, apps that, that the rest of us do who have these phones. Secondly, um, there's a population in this country uh, that doesn't have, don't have bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, that's something that a lot of these devices require. And um, so uh, cities are also working towards solutions that, that help serve the unbanked. Um, those are two basic kind of approaches that, that I've seen in transportation. But I think the overall uh, point that I would make is that we should not assume that technology on its own is going to reach everybody. And so someone at the table in the design room has to say, okay, so where are our blind spots here? And how do we find a way to ensure that we get maximum uh, penetration of this, of this new incredible technology? There's a question there. Yeah, you, yes. So I guess uh, the question is about the privacy implications of these smart devices. Yeah. So um, you know we take that seriously. We have uh, you know for instance we've added functionality to our Echo to uh, when you hit the mute bite button it uh, it cuts off all uh, communication with the device. Um, you know a lot of this is going to be you know hinge on regulation. I believe we're um, a, you know founding member of uh, various uh, groups uh, dedicated to 
harnessing the uh, power of uh, AI for um, ethical purposes. And you know, a lot of it is, gonna, is going to be um, how we use them as citizens and how um, you know, we choose to regulate that or how, how to control it. You know, there was a, a case you may have seen with our recognition software in AWS where um, it literally is a recognition software package. So if, it, if, it, if you're looking for a chair, it will tell you you matched a chair. If, it, if you're looking for a child who's lost in an amusement park, it will scan the people in the park and will find the, uh, you know, hope, hopefully find the person who was lost. So it has you know, many positive treatments. Um, the criticism was that police departments were using it to you know, un, un, uh, fairly target uh, you know, minorities. Uh, so you know, that is kind of not a technology issue, it's a use of technology issue that we have to, we're gonna have to grapple with as a society and we're gonna have to figure out what, what are you know, real uh, uses for the technology and where you know, we need to make modifications. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we have run out of time. Uh, so let's thank the panelists for this uh, very engaging and insightful conversation. Pleasure to meet you.